All right. Uh, good uh, evening. Good afternoon, everyone, wherever you're joining us. Uh, today, we have another very special guest. Of course, someone also very special to me, uh, my sensei, a longtime uh, mentor, a former professor of mine, and of course, former legislator. Uh, and, uh, you know, all, uh, eternal uh, activist, no, eternal activist, see Professor Dr. Walden Bellio. Thank you very much, Walden, for joining us. How are you, Walden? Uh, so you're joining me from, yeah, you can tell me right where you are, right? Well, I have no problem or something. Because the last time I interviewed the attorney, yeah, 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 yeah. attorney yeah, Carranza. Yeah, well, you know, I'm, I, I'm joining you from someplace in the Philippines. Yeah, yeah, okay. okay. Thank you very much, uh, Walden, for, for making this time. Obviously, we had a very uh, intense uh, elections election uh, weekend. No? So two countries that are considered as kind of a political twins, no? Turkey and Thailand. I mean, just the frequency of coup d'etats in those two countries, right? Uh, puts everyone, uh, you know, to shame, right? Um, if you're going to compete in, in the wrong way. Um, but I want to I wanted to talk about more about Thailand because you are one of the very few Filipinos I know who is very intimately familiar with Thailand, Thailand's political economy, Thailand's contentious politics. And I remember very well a decade ago, I was reading reading your works or works that you were sharing on the so-called red shirt versus yellow shirt. And obviously it's not completely analogous, but there um, are parallels with the case in the Philippines, right? The kind of a binary yellow, red. But if, if I may, well, then of course, correct me if I'm wrong. My understanding is that what we saw in the election the other night is it looks like a third force is coming through, not in a Tony Blair way, but in a much more progressive way. Uh, you know, authentic way that uh, it, it looks like Thailand is going beyond that binary between populist, you know, uh, demagogic and authoritarian monarchy, etc. And something else is coming up. Can you, first of all, explain to us, Walden, what is your understanding of, I mean, first of all, how did you get interested in, in, in Thai politics? Was it because it was familiar in a sense? It was similar to the Philippines? Like, because I noticed you're very, um, you have written a lot on Thai politics, and it's hard to find Filipino scholars, especially if you're a stature, who have paid so much attention to Thailand. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Your whole Thailand saga as a scholar. Well, um, my um, engagement with Thailand um, began in the um, uh, late 1990s, where mm -hmm. I went there to do research on the Asian the financial crisis. This is the issue. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, and also research on the Thai uh, political and economic system. Mm -hmm. And I came out with a book uh, that was uh, uh, Development and Disintegration in Modern Thailand. And that uh, was written uh, in English, of course, um, mm -hmm. but it was translated into Thai. And it was actually... I was surprised. It was adopted as a textbook uh, in oh, Thailand. Oh, wow. Uh, <laughs> and, um, like university probably, textbook? Um, yes, uh, in wow. places like the Chiang Mai University. Right, right. But that uh, sort of was my um, uh, uh, academic engagement with Thailand since that right. time. Uh, but I was also personally engaged with Thailand because the person who translated that book became my wife, uh, mm -hmm. Tongsila. Uh, she passed away about five years ago. So I both I have both a, a personal and a political uh, tie to Thailand. And I uh, spend a lot of my time there with my um, um, uh, wife's uh, relatives. Yeah. Um, so that's sort of the the background that the of my engagement with Thailand. Right. Walden, you have written a lot about lessons from Thailand for the Philippines. And I think, you know, I mean, uh, we're very familiar about the developmental state model in South Korea, in Taiwan, in Japan. We, we uh, of course, a lot of people talk about Singapore, although it's a completely different case. It's really a city state. But thanks to you, I got to appreciate how actually Thailand was one of the few ASEAN countries, right, that that try to also develop its own uh, version of a developmental state and move towards manufacturing. I mean, of course, the branding of Thailand is the Detroit of Asia, right? 
because of the huge contribution it makes to manufacturing. If, if you're driving a Japanese car in the Philippines, most likely it's it has something to do with Thailand, right? Um, um, can you tell us a little bit about that? Because you wrote about Thailand's population management policy. You, you wrote about their industrial and trade policy. To what degree do you think the Thailand experience is is relevant to the Philippines? Because I think in, by the 70s, we still had the same per capita income as Thailand, right? And then the divergence really happened towards the end of 70s and 80s. Are we kind of a kind of a uh, on uh, are are we kind of like lost cousins or kind of a twins or something with Thailand? Is that a better comparison you would say? Because the population in there are many things similar, no, in terms of size, population, etc. Not to mention their politic politics, very dynastic politics. Yeah. Right. Well, uh, in terms of just sheer GDP and GDP per capita terms, the Thais have. Uh, you know, Thailand has definitely gone way beyond us. Yes, way beyond. And yeah. um, I, I think that there are two things that um, uh, is a good explanation for this. One is they uh, basically did not uh, swallow hook, line, and sinker the mm -hmm. neoliberal policies uh, of totally, you know, privatizing uh liberalizing and deregulation deregulating that was pushed by the IMF and the World Bank um, in the Philippines um, this is the Marcos they era. Had a very very uh, era, yeah. discriminating approach there in in fact they um, Thailand re retained a highly protectionist um, right. uh, economic structure um, uh, even up till today no uh, and the second point in which we differed was they had a very successful uh, 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 population management right. policy. Yeah, right. Uh, so that... Um, you Can know, you tell us a little bit about that, Walden? Sorry to cut you there, because I think... It, you made some studies about like we're more or less on the same level in terms of population size per capita and then one major divergence happens and one big reason for you is nag introduce ng population management in Thailand kaya ngayon ng their population is like what 30 million fewer than us right yes their gdp yes. is 40% larger than us or something like that yes. their per capita is almost twice the philippines so that explains how policy is so important. It's not just culture and history. Policy matters. Can you tell right. us a little bit about that, Walden? I think that's absolutely important. Well, yes. Uh, I, I think the, you know, if you look at the uh, the most successful population uh, management program uh, in, in, in Southeast Asia was um, um, most likely that of of, of Thailand. Uh, they took right. it very seriously. The government played a very, very strong role. Uh, and uh, the fact that they did not have uh, a Catholic hierarchy that mm -hmm. was fighting it, um, you know, uh, at every step of the way made uh, a big difference. But all I wanted to say, though, here is it wasn't just Thailand, Indonesia. Right. And Vietnam uh, also had very successful uh, population management policies and um, and I, I think this you know the combination of uh, discriminating uh, not um, neoliberal economic right. policies judicious economic approach to trade and industrial policy judicious yes. yeah yeah so those those two things I think made uh, a very big difference in terms of um, our own location with respect to these countries and with Thailand in particular. Right, right. Um, I, I want to talk about tax in Shinawat shortly because I see a lot of, uh, you know, I mean, for instance, the drug war of Duterte, the antecedent of that, you could say, was tax in Shinawat, right? Uh, mm -hmm. The kind of uh, populist mobilization strategy of tax in quite similar to Duterte and also Arab Estrada, you could say to a certain degree, right? So, but I want to talk about another tax in, tax in the great, no, who kind of found the modern uh, Thai state, you know, as, as, as Benedict Anderson would put it, no? Um, now, the reason why I'm raising this, uh, Walden, is because people would argue that you can have a developmental state, meaning a state that cares about national interests, a bureaucracy that is competent, etc., if you have a long history of bureaucratic development, right, or state building, 
And if you look at Thailand, yes, I mean, of course, it was played by different superpowers, but they tried very hard to maintain a degree of strategic autonomy, even the high colonial era. They were never colonized officially, right? And during this period, they tried to develop a kind of a modern bureaucracy, right? I, I was reading history, even there were Persians and Chinese, a lot contributed to the buildup of the bureaucracy in Thailand. So in short, Medyo matino tino yung kanilang estado, no? yung, yung institution ng kanilang estado. While if you look at the Philippines, I'm not sure it's as analogous, right? I mean, neither the Americans or the Spanish really invested in strong bureaucracy. And good luck with us once the oligarchs themselves were in control of the country. Now, I'm just trying to, I don't know, I'm, I'm just trying to look at the more institutional roots, diba? Now, don't you think that Thailand was always in a better position to have a more judicious and effective trade industrial policy compared to the Philippines that never really had strong state institutions to begin with once the new liberal and hyper globalization era began? Well, uh, I would say, uh, you know, that there's certainly something there. Mm -hmm. uh, one is, of course, um, um, the... Uh, in terms of the Spanish period, we had a situation where the religious hierarchy definitely dominated the secular hierarchy. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the governor general and, you know, basically the so-called secular institutions were pretty much under the thumb of the friars. Um, and then when you came to the American period, mm -hmm. um, you know, the kind of focus that the Americans had uh, on uh, the parliamentary representative institutions, right? Uh, which they, you know, which they focused on in terms of their relationships with the Philippine elite. You know? And um, they really did not, um, you know, the, their focus was not on creating this central bureaucracy. I mean, right. they, they did that, but their focus was more on the kind of legislative checks and balances kind of stuff. Right. Um, so, very legalistic, yeah, very legalistic. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and um, you know, and of course, the, you know, even within the United States, there's always been the tension between right. local and state power versus the federal power. Right. Uh, which continues to plague the United States until uh, today. Yeah, yeah. And um, of course, the... And the same in Spain, right? I mean, the Catalonia yeah. problem, the Basque. So both of our colonizers kind of messed up administrative yeah. culture. Yeah. Uh -huh. and, then the, and then the biggest um, difference is, I think, the, the overpowering role of the civil society elites, the, mm. the landed elites, vis-a-vis uh, -vis the central state. You know? um, so it's the balance and, of power. And I, I think right. that uh, yeah. if you look at whether it's Japan or Korea or Thailand, right. the, the bureaucracy was always in a, a, a stronger position vis-a-vis -vis right. the, the, you know, uh, what we might call the civil society elites, right. you know. So, uh, so those are sort of some of the differences that would yeah. be very important in terms of your question, in terms of you know the the role of a central state. Yeah, and and I want to push on this because obviously, you know, at some point all countries were messed up, right? Uh, at some point, we were there were no really nation states to begin with, right? Um, but there were critical junctures, and certain leaders did the right thing and certain certain circumstances came together, right? To build uh, what would become more successful developmental state model here and there. Would you argue that the Marcos senior era represented a potential critical juncture to correct that gap in the Philippine nation state, which is a very weak state system? And, and do you think that Marcos Sr. at some point had indeed an intention to fill in the gap? Because there's so many quotes I have of Marcos talking about oligarchs and how they're rapacious and what we need is a strong state, right? And was that just uh, you know hot air? Or do you think that there was some some sort of a tragic element also to, to the Marcosian project that it may have had good intentions and then went? Well, I towards. think that, but, yeah. well, I think the potential was there Mm -hmm. And of course, the rhetoric was there, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. but um, 
the problem I, I think was that um, the, there was no follow through. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, in fact, it was that sort of the idea was to create a, a you know um, a, you know a strong state that would be right. devoted to national development. Uh, that failed because uh, basically Marcos, uh, you know, it became a sort of a personal cronyist empire instead of developmental state. So that was the, you know, what attracted people uh, initially, like Blas Opla and all of these people mm -hmm. that were, um, that, that, that uh, you know, were progressive intellectuals. Right. Um, was precisely this, the rhetoric that um, there was going to be this kind of development yeah. state. And then it got corrupted by Marcos's own personal ambitions, by Imelda, mm. by the cronies. Uh, and, uh, you know, you, you, you look at the situation, compare that to what was happening in South Korea, uh, yeah. where um, you had uh, Pak Chung-hee, who is a controversial figure, but even... Uh, among Koreans at this point, right. um, you know, th there is a recognition that um, he built up this 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 strong developmental state in a known nonsense sort of way, disciplined uh, the elites, disciplined right. yeah. the corporations. Uh, you know, it was like um, uh, if you did not um, follow through with the export oriented policy for instance that um you really had to you know if you were a corporation you really needed to do um a strong export orientation if you didn't right. follow through on that the government would be after you uh you know looking at your tax books and everything else so my um, I, I think the the role of the bureaucracy mm -hmm. in whether it's thailand or Korea or Japan um, was was fairly central, uh, whereas in the Philippines, I think it was the civil society interests, mm -hmm. the classes that dominated the state. In other areas, the state dominated the elites. Yeah, because I want to go back to this, right? Because the fault with the American system was that there was a parliamentary democratic politics, but from the very get go, it favored already the landed elite. So there was yep. no, no way that you can expect elected governments to go for structural transformation because that would hurt the very people who were in a position to be elected there. But all of that stopped when Marcos became the uh, Supremo, right? The Codilio, right? So he had this kind of a semi-blank slate to correct these mistakes of the past. I mean, of course, historically, you could argue that Manuel Quezon was the first guy who had that in mind, except, you know, World War II happened and all. Mm -hmm. So Marcos had this really chance to get it done. And, and, that's why I always say, you know, Marcos, Park Chung-hee, uh, Chiang Kai-shek's people in Taiwan, I can go on and on. They were all dictators, but some of them produced world-class manufacturing industries, right? Uh, in the case of Park Chung-hee, for instance, we know that he literally, like, he no stage niya yung mga malalaking pamilya, no? the, the chables of Hyundai and Samsung today. Although I know that the Samsung owner was escaped to Japan during the and told them, Either develop kaya na mga matitinong export-oriented global industries or I'm going to confiscate all your stuff and give it to someone else. And he narrowed down and narrowed down until only few major effective families were left and then would give them state subsidies, financial uh, access to you know cheap dollars, protect the economies para walang imports while they're building their infant industries. That's fine for me in a, in a descriptive sense but analytically, well, and this is going to sound a little bit uh, almost academic, but analytically, you think Marcos could not do that only because of lack of personal characteristics, certain personal uh, assets? Or do you think that Marcos also was limited to begin with, that he was never really in a position to do what Park Chung-hee was supposed to do? Because Park Chung-hee already inherited the strong bureaucracy. Uh, and, and, and of course, uh, in the case of Marcos, he got rid of the old elite. And the, but he relied on new elites, you know, who most of them had no business to be in business, right? Like, uh, unlike the the Samsung, Hyundai, Chables, they already were quite com competent in low end manufacturing, right? Until they move upwards. Uh, again, I'm I'm not here to be an apologist for the failures. I'm just trying to say, is it fair to to compare Marcos and Park Chung Hee when 
perhaps Marcos did not have the li livers, livers that that Park Chung Hee had. Or are you saying that this was really down to personal leadership and decision making, and that one ended up decadent and self serving, and the other one was brutal? Sure, Park Chung Hee was brutal, but still tried to take care of his people and and build up his national industries. That's that's one thing, Walden. The second one is also intellectual. Do you think there was an intellectual deficit on the part of Marcos? Because we know that Park Chung Hee. I mean, Marcus was a brilliant lawyer, that's a given, but I'm talking about developmental policy. Park Chung-hee was a member of the Imperial Japanese Army, I think even the Special Forces and all, and he studied very carefully the, the experience of Japan, how Japan, after major restoration, built up itself by borrowing from Germany here and there. Um, so Park Chung-hee may not have been as brilliant lawyer as Marcos, not the fancy speaker as Marcos, but he had an understanding of how late developing countries should operate. I'm not sure if Marcos ever had that kind of education, right? I don't think he ever read extensively on late developmental state, or I don't think he understood industrial trade policy as, as Park Chung he understood it. I think Marcos was a brilliant lawyer, no question about it. But but was he was he did he have the faculty to appreciate high stakes, unorthodox economic developmental policy? I, I'm just trying to ask you because I think this is these are, these are questions we usually don't ask. We, we describe the shortcomings of Marcos, but I'm just trying to understand. Is this shortcoming just a moral character issue or is it also an intellectual deficit? Or also institutionally, he didn't have the levers that Park chung Yi had, for instance, in Korea. Or am I just making excuses for this guy? Yeah. No, no. <laughs> I, I, I think these are important questions. Uh, so my sense is that, mm -hmm. you know, there was the personal ambition issue uh, in, in relation to the national vision. Right. right, and I think what happened here was those existed in conflict in Marcos, and finally, the personal ambition became the dominant force. No? Mm. The second thing is, I think the interests. You know, uh, um, my sense is that um, uh, he got so enmeshed in mm. the economic interests that you know fell into his lap. And that was sort of in, instead of 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 um, um, using that uh, in a positive way for the country, he began to just focus on personal accumulation, and had his cronies who helped him in this personal accumulation that that, that happened. Right. And then, um, with respect to the bureaucracy, I I think that again there was this tension between. Uh, a national bureaucracy that could have been developed in a sort of uh, South Korean sort of way. Right. But then um, instead became uh, uh, a bureaucracy that became mainly focused on serving the uh, Marcos's interests. You know? So there was, you know, there, there were those tensions. And unfortunately, uh, it was the personal uh, that came to the to the forefront, mm -hmm. and um, and uh, you know, um, I I I would say that, for instance, mm -hmm. um, uh, remember that the uh, Marcos had this uh, eleven big industrial projects that uh, exactly. was was basically uh, could have been the core of uh, uh, South Korean type industrial policy Tables, uh, yeah. uh, and it succeeded in Korea uh, but, but not, uh, uh, when it came yeah. to the Philippines um, basically the uh, the whole thing became enmeshed in corruption and finally when the World Bank and the IMF came in and told Marcos you're not going to get any more money uh, unless you get rid of this plan for 11 industrial projects and he backed down uh, so mm. there was that um there was an element of, um, of uh, you know, you know, there was a, the possibilities there. Right. The vision was there, right? I mean, that's my point. That he had the vision. I mean, I'm not saying this because he's our fellow Ilocan or all of that, but he had the vision. I, I, I don't think it was a whole con artist kind of stuff. I, there were. That's why the Marcos supporters and apologists can always say, "Oh, he had this project." He had that. But my point is, yeah, but. Did he create the chables that Korea created? Where are the global manufacturing brands? That yes, yes. Yes. Why didn't the Philippines create that? 
So tell me, you are 21 years in power. Show me that, right? And that's where, wala, wala ka makuha. And, and then, of course, you have the attack on Dilawans and all of that, which we can discuss later on. But we're still talking about Marcos because I think Marcos really had a chance to do what, what Park Chung-hee did in Korea for their manufacturing or the Thai bureaucracy did. I mean, the Thailand case, of course, Walden is fascinating to me because Thailand is such a messy country in terms of politics, right? Like, like a dozen coups in a century, right? Uh, how many constitutions? Like, more than 16? I mean, this is insane, right? Yeah. Like 10 coups and 16 constitution within a 70-year period under King Bhumipol. I mean, so it's amazing how Thailand managed to have this consistency in terms of building its basic economy, even when it has such a messy politics, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah, for me, that's what makes Thailand more, even more interesting and in a way also relatable. But... Can I digress a bit? Because, Walden, well, you did your PhD on the case of Chile, right? So mm -hmm. Latin America was also a region that you very much familiar as yourself. And I would admit, partly due to your influence also, I've become a big, big kind of a student of Latin American politics throughout the decades. Not to mention, of course, as Filipinos, we easily can relate to Latinos. And am I wrong to say that there's sometimes that I feel the Philippine political economy and the whole oligarchic structure is much more Latin American than Asian, in a sense? Am I, am I, or, am I deorientalizing ourselves? Like, do you find parallels in the case of Philippines and Latin America, for instance? Because even if I think of Latin America, like it's not like in Argentina or in Brazil, they didn't try to also build manufacturing, right? I think Brazil had a very robust manufacturing in the 60s and 70s. And yet it didn't still happen in the Philippines. So what's going on there, Walden? What is the Latin American comparison here or kind of a juxtaposition that you think could be helpful analytically to understand gano ka palpakin nangyari sa atin? Yeah. Well, uh, I just wanted to add on the Marcos thing before we leave that. Yeah, yeah please, please, yeah. Um, is, is that definitely, you know, uh, I, I think the personal moral failure Moral uh, failure, yeah. Marcos was fairly central to um, to his downfall, uh, and uh, as you said, unfortunately, the, you know his uh, people, um, you know the the loyalists and all of those people, uh, just remember sort of the vision. Okay. Yeah, but not the implementation. <laughs> but, yeah. but forget the fact that uh, the guy did not deliver and he he instead he delivered to his uh, family. Right. Now, of course, we all know that there's even a, a theory there among the loyalists that, oh, it wasn't Marcos, it was it was Imelda, the Visayan. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the Ilocano version. Yeah, yeah, I know. Right. I, hate, I so don't that's... like that. Yeah, I don't yeah, like and that it's, people it's do really, that. It's yeah. really... First of all, it's it's really misogynist. Okay? Uh, secondly, is ethnic discrimination. Was yeah, and it's an ethnic discrimination, right? Uh, yes. just, sorry, Walden, to cut you there. I was in 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 Malaysia, but Putrajaya just the other month, right? And guess what? Mm -hmm. I hear everyone blaming. No, it's not Najib. It's the wife. You know, the Hermes bag woman. Yes, yes. Right? Like, yes. No, Najib yes. is a good guy. It's just the wife who kind of like I said. I've heard that before, like this yes, is yes, giving yes. a pass it's, to the guy, yeah, you know. So of I course, mean, it's not a Filipino thing, pala, no? Like sure. Yeah. I mean, Imelda is uh, is crazy by herself, okay. Uh, <laughs> but but that doesn't give blame, a pass, yeah, to Marcos. To blame um, what happened uh, to Imelda instead of Marcos is, I think, really a, a real distortion of of history. But in any event, um, coming back to your to your question. Um, well, definitely the the sort of landowner structure right. uh, that we inherited from the encomienda system in the Philippines that then uh, turned out uh, into um, an hacienda system uh, uh, from during the Spanish period was was is is something that uh, very much connects us with uh, Latin America. Uh, I think that the uh, the role of the church uh, uh, is also something that uh, very much connects us to, Similar to Latin America exactly to Spain yeah. and and to Latin America uh, except of course uh, we've also already seen how in Latin America they have they the role of the of the Catholic Church has be become much less central 
uh, than in the Philippines. No? And the liberation theology also aspect, right? Progressive Catholic. Yeah. Um, right. Know. But but I, I would say that um, even in Latin America at this point, the the um, the religious alternatives in terms of the evangelicals is they're they're much they're getting very strong there now right and the old, um, superiority of catholicism is no longer there you know like for instance in the case of brazil bolsonaro yeah. um, bolsonaro um, when he ran for the elections the evangelicals played a very strong right. role in right. putting him into office. No? So there are this, um, um, and of course the, you know, when when it comes to, again, the way that um, uh, class interests colonizes the bureaucracy, right. uh, that's, uh, and, and prevents the, the emergence of a developmental state. I think that's also something that we share with-, with uh, Latin America. Latin America. Yeah. And also the um, anti-democratic middle class sentiment, right? I mean, you did your PhD, I think, in Chile, right? And and I think you, yes. you were there at a very important time. This is uh, towards the end of the Salvador Allende time and pre-Pinochet? Yes, is... I was there from, uh, yeah. you know, 1971, 72, uh, doing my research. Um, uh, this was during the period of Salvador Allende and... Uh, yeah. I, I did my research on the middle class and the sort of very um, uh, um, uh, tragic way that the tragic, middle exactly. class uh, mobilized against Allende and created, helped create this situation of um, uh, terrible dictatorship of Pinochet that uh, uh, lasted uh, way up to the 1990s. Right, right. Now, now, obviously, the Chile case that you studied, in a way, was also very relevant to Thailand, right? I'm just connecting all the dots here, because in Thailand, also, with the yellow shirt phenomenon, we saw how the middle class, especially in Bangkok, right, at some point, essentially became an anti-democratic element, right? Uh, anti-democratic in a sense of going against electoral mandate per the electoral process, and here is where Taksin Shinawat comes into being. Uh, did Taksin Shino, uh, did Taksin feel someone familiar to you? Like, um, or what did he become even more familiar when we had someone like Duterte later on, or because of the Arab Estrada experience? Because uh, me as a I as a Filipino, like whenever I, I, I see the Taksin, I look like Taksin is like it's like Arab and Duterte and Bina and even Billy are all of them put together, right? He kind of has all of those elements, right? Kind of a shrewd businessman like Villiar, the kind of a man of the people populist like Binay, and then tough on drugs, quite violent, uh, like Duterte, etc. Can you tell me a little bit about, about Taksin and what is your reading of the whole Taksin Shinawat and the so called red shirt uh, movement uh, in, in Thailand? Well, I think he was a very, as you say, he was a very um, interesting figure. A complex guy. In that he was as you said, a, a successful uh, uh, businessman. Uh, he, you know, he, um, you know, appealed very much to the rural people in, in Thailand right. and to the urban lower classes. And um, he was definitely seen as a threat to the monarchy in, right. in, 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 in Thailand. And, uh, and um, he had his own uh, people in initiatives in in the police force as well as in the military to to try to dislodge this strong royalist aristocratic um, uh, yeah. force uh, in in uh, you know in in these institutions and right. um, so you know and and also he was um, he was a nationalist uh, he yes. basically told. Um, the IMF and the World Bank, yeah. after they had paid, that Thailand had paid them off in 2001, 2002, uh, yeah. that we're no longer going to, again, borrow from you because you're screwing us. And uh, Thailand has never gone back uh, ever since then. So he, he, he combined this populism and nationalism and anti-royalist anti and, uh, uh, and anti-military 
uh, uh, kind of figure. Uh, and they, they, the, the the established interest in Thailand felt very much threatened by that. Threatened, exactly. And yeah. that led to the coup against him in 2006. Um, and so, um, uh, you know, which preceded the 2014 uh, coup. So, um, uh, and of course, there's that uh, element of the drug war. Um, yeah, can uh, can we talk a little bit before the coup and all of that? Because I want to also talk about your experience because you were there in Bangkok, right? When the violent crackdown happened, this is 2010, if I'm not mistaken. Uh the the crackdown on the when the pro toxin people occupied central Bangkok and then the very violent situation happened, right? This is this is yeah. this is under Vijajiwa, right? Abisit time, right? Um, yeah. Well, can we retract slightly? Can we talk about Taksin? Because again, he's another very complex figure, right? Just like Marcos. I think there are many dimensions to him. Walden, can you tell us, did he really deliver to the people? Because a lot of his biographers will say for all of his faults, and we know the reason why he's he was toppled is when he was trying to ram that deal with the Singaporeans, right? Which really brought the middle class, you know? So, and, you know, a lot of internal self-dealing was allegedly happening during his time that made his family super rich in the telecom industry and all. But many would argue he did deliver on the universal health care, on the basic asphalt. I mean, the, the rural Thailand is so beautiful, right? I mean, the basic infrastructure is so much better than places like the Philippines or I would even say Indonesia. Yeah. Until Johor. Well, he did uh, deliver on, yeah. on social issues, definitely the universal health care program uh, uh, where you could get treated for anything. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The equivalent of one dollar then. One dollar, yes, one dollar. Yeah. That's something that's been retained because no government, whether it's military or civilian, will, uh, uh, you know, has the guts to take that away. Yeah. Uh, because yeah. Uh, they would be toppled immediately if right. they they abolish that. So, so Taksin, you know, did uh, uh, Taksin did deliver, but I I guess it's because he was delivering so successfully. Mm. Uh, that you know the the monarchy and the aristocracy really really got worried, you know that um, their influence would would be lost, and that's that's basically what explains why they 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 moved to topple him in two thousand and six, and again in two thousand fourteen, you know. So, but um, but ever since Taksin, um, it's um, Thailand has never been the same. Uh, and uh, I think what we're seeing again is another um, mm -hmm. stage uh, in in Thailand's transformation, and I hope that this will be you know something that will definitely move into the future instead of sliding back to the past of military coups against democratically elected governments. Right, right. Um, you were there when the violent. Uh, crackdown happened on the red shirts. No, I mean it, it got ugly at some point. No, that the uh, the yellow shirt back. This is Abisit, I think administration. Kind of, I think the joke was Abisit was kind of like Maro Haas of Thailand or something like that. Like uh, another Ivy League graduate, you know, squeaky squeaky clean looking guy. But uh, many people were saying that he was not as progressive as he should have been. Can you tell me a little bit of your experience because things got really ugly between the yellow shirt and red shirts, right? Uh, for quite some time between two thousand six and two thousand fourteen. Can you tell yeah, me about so your that own? That was the central. The yeah. Uh, basically, the yellow shirts became very much uh, uh, identified with uh, the the monarch and the aristocracy, uh, you know, as uh, and and the middle classes. No? I right. mean, it was a middle class based movement right. that felt very much threatened by the populist policies of Taksin that had a very, very strong base, uh, especially in the Northeast and in the North and in rural Thailand. Uh, so he, right. you know, Taksin basically won over uh, rural Thailand. And uh, so, you know, the, the, the kind of um, 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 politics that were represented by the yellow shirts was mainly middle class Bangkok and uh, the the Thai South, uh, which was a Democrat uh, party uh, stronghold. So um, the Democrat 
a party um, since the early 19, 1990s. Right. You know, it was a reform party, but under the challenge that was posed by Taksin, it became more and more and more of a reaction right. uh, to, to Taksin's populist policies. And of course, this was a reaction that tied in well with the interests of the establishment in Thailand, uh, the, the military, the monarchy. Uh, and, 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 and so um, the, you know, this came to a head yeah. in um, that period from 2010 to 2014, because um, the, the, you know, the, the, you know, that, the Taksin revolution had been so successful right. that um, um, that elections kept on yielding, um, you know, uh, pro Taksin parties into power. So there was this sense Doing that the sister, right, and now almost the yeah. daughter. I mean, that's as close yeah. as it can get. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. but you know, it, 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 the basically the 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 middle class cum aristocracy, cum monarchy, cum military right. uh, uh, grouping uh, no longer believed that they could win uh, through elections. So uh, what happened between 2010 and 2013 is they basically mobilized the Bangkok middle class in consistent uh, rallies to, to bring down the taxing government of the sister at that point in time. Because they knew that if you held elections, you would again fall <laughs> into no you know, having to confirm a pro taxin uh, majority. But the uh, what's interesting about the new elections that has happened is that um, for the first time, um, it is a non taxin party. Um, the you know the uh, forward. Move forward, party move forward. Yeah, that move became forward. the the main um, dominant uh, force in the opposition, mm -hmm. and the Taksin Party has Puyatai, um, you know, was it just came in second, so right. that's that's a very significant thing that we're seeing in this 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 um, in this in these elections. It's not only the mm -hmm. military that lost. It's not only the monarchy that lost. Uh, there was also a setback uh, for the populist taxing party. Right. And this new force uh, of young young politicians right. uh, that that uh, basically, you know, six years ago, you would probably have not even thought that they would emerge. Now yeah. they have become the central force of the opposition. Right. And, and I mean, the of course, the antecedents is interesting. No, I mean, if you look at the uh, move forward, it, used, it was future forward and it was found actually by an industrial tycoon. Right. I mean, speaking of oligarchs, I mean, you have a situation of oligarchs backing actually progressive parties. Right. In the case of Thailand, I don't know if we can even call them oligarchs anymore, because, you know, uh, in the case of founder of the future forward party, we're talking about someone who was uh, in charge of a major manufacturing industry in Thailand. Right. Um. Well, then, can I? Uh, I don't want to stretch the analogies or parallelism too much, but obviously, we have to talk about the Philippines. We want to talk about the Philippines, you know, ultimately more. We're here as two Filipinos who care about Philippines, uh, not as Thai Thailand experts per se. Um, did the yellow red shirt showdown kind of eerily for you echo what was happening at the dos at tres kind of situation, kind of like air up? It's a tres, it's a dos, the middle class, uh, uh, liberal, uh, you know, the, the, the anti-Arab movement. Does it have a kind of parallelism? Because, you know, I think Mike Garrido, right, in his book, Patch, uh, Patchwork City, right, in, in the case, analyzing Manila, kind of made very strong analysis of the how the it's a dos, tres situation was a major fault line. It created a major fault line in Philippine foreign policy, uh, Philippine political landscape that we're still grappling with. No, And, and my sense is, my sense is there might be some parallels though with the case of Thailand. Was there, or again, I don't want to overstretch the parallelism, but the idea of a, a you know a middle class that is 
kind of reactionary, giving up on democracy because they feel that, oh, pag election yan, mananalong yan ng mga populist na yan. And then sa kabila, of course, this sense that they feel their democratic mandate is not being respected by the uh, by the middle classes. So they want to push also for more radical policies, uh, even authoritarian for that matter. I think Tafsin was dreaming of, right? Supplanting the monarchy at some point, right? Can you tell me a little bit about that? Do, do you see some parallels with the Etza dos Tres kind of? showdown in the Philippines. Well, yes, uh, you know, definitely. I, I I think that the, you know, the sense that Arab was uh, um, very much, um, um, you know, a force that was right. allied to the poor, uh, both the urban and the rural poor, um, and the, the fear uh, of uh, uh, the middle class, the right. church, um, uh, you know this this you know to to create basically I, I hate to use the word yellow at that point but yeah uh, yeah I, it's your point yeah. this came this were the people who came behind um, uh, Gloria Macapagal Arroyo uh, right. and uh, so you know so I I think there was that that element of um, of a yellow shirt versus red shirt happening in the Philippines, which culminated in 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 Edsa Thress. And there was always that sense that um that uh, uh, it was an undemocratic um uh taking away uh, of right. somebody who had won electorally and in it was a it was a very damaging um impact that had a very damaging impact in terms of, of institutional democratic politics in the Philippines right. um, and help weaken it. Uh, and uh, even Cory Aquino at some point um, apologized to Arab that, you know, she had participated in this, mm -hmm. in, 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 mm -hmm. in this process of edging him out. So, um, so I, I think to a large extent, the, um, populist forces behind uh, Arab, um, you know, to some extent uh, were translated into the populism of Duterte, uh, yeah. where we then had um, uh, coming into 2016, mm. a, uh, what had become a sharper polarization between the uh, uh, liberal led uh, middle class mm -hmm. uh, and the and the and 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 the populists led by um, Duterte, and um, but this um, I would say that uh, that dimension of conflict is very important, but uh, I would say though that um, a big big problem uh, that both led to Duterte and to the Marcos comeback. Is right. that the EDSA state that emerged in 1986 um, had a lot of promises, uh, especially when it came to social justice, redistribution, and everything right. that uh, it didn't deliver on. Uh, so my my sense is that um, a great deal of the dynamics since 1986 was of um, was was of a movement. Right. Uh, a liberal movement that did not deliver on its promises uh, for about 30 years, uh, especially when it came to uh, social justice issues, economic issues. And Why do you think so, Walden? I want to. So, while we talked about what you what you thought was uh, the shortcomings of of the Marcos uh, regime in terms of translating its unprecedented position of primacy into really building a strong economy and manufacturing base with the liberals or the people who came after Mar Marcos senior where do you think they came short again was it an intellectual shortcoming was it a failure of imagination or kind of political will and character I don't use the word political will or um you know what I'm saying Co conviction political conviction what was going on I mean how do you understand this world and the reason again I'm asking is because you're a very comparative person, right? Um, you know, you, I mean, personally, that's that's one thing that I always appreciate in your writings is you never understand, you never analyze the Philippines on its own terms. You always look at many, many similar countries and how they got 
out of their cycles, vicious cycles. And for some reason, Philippines keeps on struggling in coming out of the vicious cycle whenever we get a chance. Marco Sr. had a chance to do that in terms of a robust economy. ETSA provided a chance for us to get out of the whole oligarchic, dynastic, authoritarian politics. And yet we keep on coming short. What's going on there, Walden? Well, I, I again, all of this, you know, are contingent. You know, there were, as you said, there was the Marcos opportunity and Marcos screwed it up himself. <laughs> and then there was the EDSA opportunity. And that was also screwed up because of a number of factors. Um, and I think fairly central to this um, was that um, the, the, the role of the IMF and the World Bank um, in terms of really imposing a very neoliberal policy in the Philippines that um, basically, um, you know, um, made it extremely difficult to have the resources mm -hmm. uh, to pursue a developmental direction because once you had structural adjustment and the primacy of paying off the Marcos credit that were imposed on you, you're talking about something um, of the order uh, of 20 to 40 percent of the government budget going to debt service each yeah. year and um, which means that you've lost any capacity for capital expenditures uh, you're basically just uh, paying off operational expenses and um, so at the same time you had our neighbors uh, really focusing on state-led development, right. uh, and uh, so we we it's not a surprise that um, that between uh, uh, 1990 and 2010 the Philippines uh, was the second slowest growing country mm. uh, in Southeast Asia, second only to Brunei. But then Brunei, as we know, can't yeah, afford not to grow. Yeah. The Philippines has to grow, you know. Especially uh, if our then, population is also not being managed in any sense of the word, right? Yes, yes. And and then uh, uh, the other thing that, of course, I wanted to add was that um, the policies uh, that uh, led to the destruction of our manufacturing base um, and the when we joined the WTO, the policies that led to the destruction of our agricultural base. So basically, we had 30 years where uh, not only was there no social redistribution, but you had a drastic weakening of the Philippine economy to the point that um, for those who wanted to get ahead, there was only one way, which was um, labor export. Right. Uh, and labor export um, um, became institutionalized during this period so that, uh, you know, there was just this sense that, uh, especially among younger people growing up, that there were no opportunities in the Philippines uh, because there was no industry, no agriculture. You had very light uh, a kind of coal center type of industry, so it was better to go abroad. So I, I think that, um, these policies have become so institutionalized. And the tragedy is that our technocrats, our economists, and our elite uh, politicians can't think beyond the, the sort of neoliberal framework of just a completely open economy that has just not delivered you know, in terms of what should be the national objectives of building a strong economy that's also uh, just. So I think that um, it was this sense of um, failure that led to um, the regrouping of populist forces from era to Duterte, right. and which led to the opening uh, that led to Marcos's right. comeback, the Marcos's comeback in 2022 uh, elections. So um, I know that there are people who would argue that um, it was uh, the Marcos's money manipulating the the social media, mm. uh, uh, creating a past that was um, um, uh, that was a, a different past from what really transpired. 
I don't argue that that had an effect, um, but I still think that the main effect was really the fact that the EDSA Republic did not deliver on its right. promises. Exactly. And so so I, to just blame it on disinformation is a kind of giving yourself a free pass in terms of not really delivering to the average Filipino. Yes. The kind of growth and promise and social justice. That's my point. I think there's unfortunately a perverse interest in overemphasizing the disinformation problem uh, in order to kind of gloss over the more fundamental issue. Because for me, to say it's all disinformation is actually an insult to the voters, right? Because there's a legitimate basis for the voters to revolt against yes. what we believe is a broken system. And I think this is where we all agree. And I think this is where we pissed off a lot of people, right? Because Unfortunately, I think a lot of people are too invested. And I, the other day I said something like, maybe I, I think another professor of my Sweden would so I think well, kind of liked it. And maybe because I use econ term, I said, the problem with this information analysis is that it overemphasizes the supply side of the analysis, which is supply of this information, Cambridge Analytica, blah, blah. But you're forgetting the demand side. Why are people receptive to this disinformation to begin with? Because they're pissed off, because they're emotionally anxious because they didn't get what they wanted, right? And maybe because our education system, which we had years to fix, did not also equip us with the right faculty to filter as much of uh, interest. So this is the problem yeah. I have today because the opposition in the Philippines seems to be stuck in this just, it's all this information, yeah. it's all this information, which I believe is analytically lazy and I think even morally questionable because you're you're trying to overlook the complete failure of the post Marco system to fix the the problems that we inherited back then, including the debt that we should have asked to be forgiven. I still do not understand. Well, then what is your reading on that? Because Winnie Munsud would argue that back then her advice was to get much of that debt canceled. Anyway, if these were Marcos Cronis, it, these were odious debt. Don't you think that was also a major strategic mistake for us to- oh, Yes, definitely. And I, you know, I'm, um, um, I think Winnie Monsod's um, uh, argument back then, she was, uh, you know- Meda, right? Meda, head. yeah. Uh, you know, was there was a legitimate, uh, legitimate reason for uh, canceling that debt, and um, and she knew very well that it, it was pesos and centavos. That if um, you know, if you poured money into um, repaying the debt, uh, you know, you would be taking away money from very much uh, needs for capital expenditures. And all sorts of government spending. Uh, so, um, and you, you know, think so we could have afforded it, Walden. Was, sorry, just to play the devil's advocate, that argument would be well, if we didn't do that, the financial markets would have shut us out. Uh, there would be kind of a, a credit rating crisis, etc. You, you, your argument is that we could have uh, we could have overcome that. I know you you have the Argentina case in mind, but it's not like Argentina is the most encouraging country nowadays, is it? But I'm just pushing this argument, right? Yeah. No, no, no. I, the thing is that we didn't even negotiate. Ah, we didn't the even bother. That's what that, you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. We, you know, the thing is that there was just an acceptance on the part of the Cory Aquino government and the Ramos administration and all the succeeding administrations that, you know, if you even try to negotiate or to raise something, then the capital markets will run oh, against you. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. it was just this big uh, fear yeah, that Google even plan. just raising, renegotiating the debt would get you into trouble, which was really awful, you know? Awful. Uh, exactly, exactly. That, that meant that you were foreclosing uh, even the possibilities of, you know, of, of having a more manageable uh, yeah. um, right. debt repayment, uh, re restructuring of the debt. And that's what a number of other countries, in fact, did um, by posing the question of renegotiation. They were able to get a better solution uh, to the to to their debt situation. Which, you know, that's the that's why the uh, the model debtor strategy of Cory Aquino that we will pay whatever is demanded by the 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 the. Um, the uh, yeah, 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 which was repeated again by unfortunately Lenny Robredo uh, during the 2022 campaign that we will we will pay whatever our creditors demand uh, because we are model debtors. Uh, I think I think this was a disastrous policy. You cannot be miscongeniality in this affairs. This is a matter of national interest. Well, then I want to push you on this because some would say the Philippines has a distinctly rapacious elite and and. 
Uh, I mean, it's like all countries have rapacious elite, but it's like the Philippines is just next level for for a lot of people and um for a lot of observers. Now, I want to ask on this. I mean, don't you think one reason why our elite never were really trying harder, whether it's debt cancellation, whether it's making sure the investments go into really manufacturing, is because they could always insulate themselves. A lot of them were Hashenderos anyway. A lot of them came from rich families. So even if the Philippines gets suffers, not that their family would suffer, right? They would still be in a relatively economically, and then they'll still get their Time magazine cover. They're going to still get the glowy magazine coverage by the Western media because they were nice to the international community, right? I mean, that's the problem, right? There's the sense that the elite in the country tend to think about their, uh, you know, as long as I insulate myself and my interests, you know, the country is an abstract thing, perhaps, you know, like that tends to be the reality, right? Well, in, in other countries, you don't feel that the elites are as much you know, uh, just thinking in parochial, let's say, uh, and, and they really think about the suffering that their country is going to suffer. The humiliation of their country is their own personal humiliation. I mean, there's that kind of a direct one-to-one -one correspondence, which I don't feel our elites exhibit as much. Again, this is relative. Of course, there are some Filipino leaders who are way better than others, no question about it. But overall, right? I mean, there's just something something bizarre going on there, Walden. It doesn't that... Like, you, you tell me about that, Walden. I mean, you, you know a lot. You have dealt with, you have studied so many elites all around the world, varieties of oligarchs. And yet it looks like our oligarchs are among the most rapacious, right? They don't create global manufacturing brands. Tell me, what, what is our counterpoint to forget about? I mean, we don't even have a Proton, right? We don't even have a VinFast. Forget about Hyundai, right? Um, What's going on here, uh, Walden? What is your, do you think that perhaps you and I are not equipped because we're not anthropologists? Do we need... <laughs> Do we need anthropologists to do this? Perhaps this is not a sociologist, political scientist job. Well, it's it's the um, my my own sense is yeah. you're definitely right that um, you do have a very very you know uh, insulated elite that mm -hmm. thinks mainly in terms of its a local political and economic interests. That's that's really the key and. Um, with a very little sense of the national interest um, in mind, um, and for which government is really something that you use in order to um, push your, um, your 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 dynastic interests, you know, which is you know one of the things that Paul Hutchcroft has underlined, right. which I think is really true. So you have. Uh, an elite that is really not oriented towards a national project, but mainly towards local its local dynastic interests, and you know, uh, you know, they 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 are the ones that create the coalitions right. that are not based on any kind of uh, social issues, but mainly based on their own, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, interests. Yeah. Uh, whoever. Um, uh, is the leader like the Marcos um, uh, Duterte coalition? It had no um, uh, common um, uh, social interests that it was pushing for the good of the country. It was just you know we get together because we you know we you know we um, uh, you know what what brings us together is we need to win this election and then let's parcel out power. And this is also going the weakness of the Marcos. Uh, Duterte alliance, which I think is already fraying, uh, because it's brought together by nothing else but uh, partitioning um, the resources of the country. You know, so um, that's the kind of national elite that we we have. And then, of course, there's also the sense that you don't offend the big white man, uh, which is Washington. You know, or and uh, not offend China nowadays if you were Duterte. Don't offend the yeah the big uh, man in Zhongnanhai in Beijing. Right. Too. Yeah. yeah. You know, don't don't like offend the big players. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. You know, you just you just um uh you just play along with them because you know, take Marcos at this point in time. Okay. Team so team we team. have uh we have a national leader, right? Uh he's the president, but um his main concern is that the United States does not get hold of his interests and his family's interests, um, you know, in 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 the different parts of the world, 
uh, because uh, the U.S., when it wants to get you, uh, can freeze your assets everywhere. And I think that's the reason why um, Marcos Jr. has now become such a big... Star um, ally. Star uh, ally of Washington. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, the star ally of Washington is... Yeah. Well, first of all, I served in Congress together with him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I remember. You told me it was not too bad in terms of his speech back then. I thought that at that time... <laughs> Yeah, but uh, but then coming to think about it, he what never really like thought it? about the national interest. You know, right. uh, it was really, you know, he, it was it it with with respect to the Marcos family, it's always been how do you protect your 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 your, your interests, your local interests, uh, and I think that's the weakness of this administration or, or of the president, Blood which makes him flag. very. Um, vulnerable to blackmail on the part of the United States because they've got their money everywhere, but it's also everywhere where the United States can, like it has done with the uh, uh, with Putin's um, uh, right. allies, it has frozen them. You know, <laughs> so so uh, that was a, that was the basic threat I think that was posed. If you're not going to be with the United States, then you better make sure that you know that you're being exposed to its capacity uh, for freezing your assets. You know, So my sense is that's what explains why we now have an administration that's practically turned over the Philippines or outsourced the Philippines uh, foreign and um, defense policies to Washington. The United States. Um we're towards the end of our conversation. I, I know you must be very exhausted, Walden. Um, um, I, two things. One, um, kamusta si Marcos Jr. sa'yo? Are you surprised by how things are turning out, including the fraying between House of Marcos and the third? I know both of us have written on that in the past. We anticipated that. But is the current contours of the uh, let's say disalignment within the Marcos Duterte axis is that something that is interest? I mean, do you think this is this could work for the Philippines in a certain way? Uh, I mean, the Delima situation seems to be on a more positive trajectory. Relations with the media seem to be on better trajectory. The drug war seems to be not as aggressive and deadly as before. Uh, and at least the cow out to China kind of stuff. I mean, we can talk about the U.S. part, but at least. Don't you think that that's also an interesting thing? Is Marcus Jr. Uh, turning out as more anodyne as perhaps critics were uh, suggesting? And for you, do you think that's actually what makes it scarier or worse? I mean, what is your what's your what's your read on on Marcus Jr. so far? First year of Marcus. Well, my own sense is, um, if you talk about the dominant feature of the first year of Marcos, it has been uh, when it comes to foreign policy, which has been, um, you know, a complete uh, turnaround from the yeah, yeah, yeah. alliance Very with China or uh, to, um, to, um, to a, you know, almost complete subservience to the United States, you know, so I think that's, that's bad. Okay. Um, uh, but let me just phrase that a bit, um, uh, put that a bit more, because towards the end of his administration, Duterte was in fact um, um, moving away from his uh, anti-U.S. stance. Right. 2020, uh, 21. Yeah, exactly. Definitely. Yeah, he, he, he gave up on canceling the VFA. Yeah, exactly. He started praising the United States alliances. And my sense is that Duterte got scared of the military. Um, because I think he knew that the military was very much institutionally allied with the United States yeah. and yeah, that yeah. they might tolerate his rhetoric against the United States, but they were not going to tolerate any moves yeah, to true. weaken ties, you know. So, um, so, uh, so, but, but now what we've seen, and this is the irony of it, um, Richard, right. is that <laughs> Marcos Jr. is carrying out the uh, policy of uh, Pinoy. Exactly. Remember, it was, exactly. So it, Edgar Plus. So it, I mean, it's not just yeah. Edgar Plus. He's adding on Aquino, right? Yeah. Like, it's, it's, so this Aquino, this Aquino, uh, Marcos rivalry, yeah. uh, you know, sort of 
in the sense that you had that it's so ironic because both Marcos and Aquino, you know, were for complete alliance with the United States. You Alignment know, so. against China. Yeah. Yeah. So that's one thing. On the, on the second front, on the domestic front, I think that um, you have a situation, I think, where the alliance is fraying. And I think we've seen the the, the different uh, things that have happened around Bantag, around the Delima uh, well, issue, uh, where they, you know, where uh, Marcos Jr. and the um, uh, Turtis have really come into near open conflict uh, at this point. And I think that's sort of um, going to worsen at this point. Um, because I don't see the Marcoses allowing uh, Sara Duterte to be the next president. There's just no way. The Marcoses are fairly, you know, they, they know that Tulfo they now have... option? Rafi yeah. Tulfo? Do you think Rafi Tulfo is their potential option? Because I know Rafi Tulfo people are already eyeing 2028, right? I don't know what's, uh, you know, yeah. is is that... Uh, yeah. Like, who will be their candidate against Sarah, right? I mean, yeah. Tulfo looks yeah. like a very... So, Sentiment. Yeah, so so that's going to come to a head at, at right. some point in 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 time, and then the the third thing is that um, uh, it doesn't seem like um, like uh, Marcus Jr. is really has enough interest in you know different economic issues. Uh, you know, so but I'm, he's just. You know, he's just uh, he's a salesman. He's he's the chief yeah. branding yeah. officer, right? He's like the yeah. He's, like yeah, he's not to... about making economic reforms. Just he's just there to. I mean, you know, when it comes to agriculture, you know, he he was, you know, he, he in fact, uh, uh, while he was he was managing the directly managing the agricultural uh, department, nothing happened. Okay. Um, the price of onions really kept on going up. There was really no, no hands-on kind of situation. Right. But the point is that he seems to be much, much more uh, happy uh, being abroad uh, and uh, rather Jella than being, yes. being in the country. You know, so you know, so it's it's like um, who's in charge? You know. That's that's the question that you ask at this point in time. And I would say it was worse under Duterte. I mean, come on. I'm not sure whether it was Duterte at some point. At least with Marcos, I know he's in, like in in coronation. He's in the White House. You know, what I'm saying he's in. I don't know somewhere. Well, no, well if you're asking me, is Marcos Jr. Uh, an incarnation of uh, of uh, Marcos Senior, who who was basically, you know. Uh, uh, very much uh, focused on power uh, yeah. and keeping that power. He's not and making sure that nothing gets in the way of him. He's the opposite, right? Yeah. You know, so he's probably not that of an incarnation. Uh, yeah. of, he's not. Of, he's not. You can. Power. His temperament yeah. is very different, right? He doesn't have that aggressive ambition to him. He's a very conflict avoidant person. I mean, he, he. I mean, some would say perhaps he's more Romualdez, right, than Marcos. Perhaps you could say that, right? Perhaps you know he's he's more on the mom side than the dad side. Uh, you could say that. Um, well, the last point, and I think this is really where it's, I think this is where it's close to our hearts and it's very important. The reason why I ask us to have Thailand as a takeoff point, the Thai election, is precisely what we discussed a while ago, right? Mm -hmm. That now with the Future Forward Party. Something that was considered as impossible and too radical just a few years ago. I mean, they're asking for a minimum wage of $13. That's higher than, I don't know, most U.S. states. They're asking for same-sex union um, marriages. They're talk They're asking, more importantly, the less majest laws to be removed. Uh, this will hurt the monarchy. They're asking for mandatory military conscription. to be removed. Like, these are radical proposals, right? Especially by Thailand, uh, uh, Thai political standard. And yet they want more than any other parties. And they were just new. They just came. Um, so it seems like Thailand is finally having a kind of a third force, not in a Tony Blair way, but in a really authentic, genuine third force way. Kamustang Pilipinas, Walden, I mean, from your experience of running the elections last year, from the 
a lot of these ugly back and forths we have seen among supposed fellow opposition leaders, all this obsession about, oh, it's all disinformation. What do you feel about it? I mean, can you see that at some point the Philippines can move in that direction? Kind of, you know, you were compared to the Bernie Sanders of the Philippines. You think like Vico Soto could be our version of Pita, the leader of Future Forward Party? Like, I, I just, I don't want to force the point. But what gives you hope about the Philippines and what is the roadmap to a more hopeful Philippines? And I, 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 I ask you all then because, man, I, I, there, are no, there are not many people I know in this world who are not only world-class scholars and committed civil society members, but people that are ready to get down and dirty. And you risk yourself, you risk your life, you, 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 know, you, you risk it all. And I could see you're someone who has fully committed yourself to your country. You're, you're, you're renowned all around the world. And this is where my respect comes for you all. Then you were never the, just that annoying professor, or not just that morally self-righteous civil society guy, or and never a trapper, right? I think you're the only guy who resigned from a congressional seat in Philippine history. I don't know if there's anyone else, based on your principle and conviction. And I think this was disagreement with Pinoy over the Mamasapana situation. Tell me, Walden, what gives you hope, and what is a roadmap towards a more hopeful future for the Philippines? Because to be honest, Walden, the reason why I'm doing this podcast is really because of these questions, right? We're doing all of these things because we want to hope that one day hopefully we'll be in a better state of mind, uh, state of appreciation of progressive politics, and that the Philippines could do something that, forget about Norway or New Zealand, but at least something that some of our friends in Malaysia and Thailand are finally doing, right? Countries that are in a far more difficult situation than ours in terms of freedom of expression, freedom of press and assembly. Like what Anwar Ibrahim had to face, what Pita had to face in Thailand, what Anwar had to face in Malaysia is incomparable to the difficulties that Lenny Robredo faced in the Philippines. No offense. I, I, I'm not saying Lenny had it easy. She had it hard. But please, Lang, don't say opposition. Do you have any idea how hard the situation was for Amnor Ibrahim? He had like twice been a siya for sodomy charges on the crazy stuff. Do you have any idea what Pita of the future forward part of Thailand had to face to get where he was? And he's still going to have a very perilous path in front of him. I just keep on hearing Walden excuses that we didn't do this because of that. Kawawa naman leaders natin. I appreciate na lang natin itong... But what I'm saying is, look at all of these neighbors of ours. They're facing 10 times more difficulty than us, and yet they're moving more successfully than us towards a more progressive third force politics. What gives you hope, Walden, and what is the roadmap forward? Sorry, I got a little bit emotional about this because, you know, like, I don't know what happened to us. Well, you know, I mean, yeah, I, 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 I really appreciate your concerns, uh, Richard, and um, it's easy to 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 lose hope in the Philippines. Uh, but let me just say that uh, one of the things you forgot about Thailand is the the um, the 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 party that came in third uh, was the party that successfully legalized uh, marijuana. Oh right, right, yeah, 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 yeah. Of so, course, yes, yes. so you know, the, so you yes, you right. you have this right. very interesting combination of parties that right. are moving forward on different fronts towards the future, right? Um, while uh, you know, in the Philippines, we exactly you know we still have like this, and, and let's not forget that one of the big problems in the Philippines is not just the military. It's not just the, the kind of, uh, you know, the, the horrible drug war. It's not just the Marcoses. It's also the Catholic Church hierarchy that continues to uh, uh, to, to, to put a block into effective uh, uh, family planning and reproductive health for women. You know? So um, this is, you know, so what gives me hope is that, uh, uh, and roadmap, like what should we do? What are the things yes. that we have to work on? Yeah, not, not this is not an exercise in sentimental sure. nonsense, right? Well, we're serious. No, that, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. The, 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 I, I, I think that um, my sense is that uh, at some point you hit rock bottom. Mm. And um, I think the hope of the country is really the youth of the country that realizes that it's been right. going off in this tangent uh, that creates so much hopelessness, uh, especially for the youth, especially for the millennials and for the generation um, Z. No? Mm. Uh, and my sense is they are the ones who are beginning to open up 
to the past to to alternative thinking right uh, because right uh, my my own sense is that the mind uh and is the most important thing that once people begin to open themselves up to the possibilities of other futures rather than this hopeless one that is afforded by our current elites then I think that is what mm. gives me hope because I really, really think that, um, uh, especially from the last elections, right? When I and Leode de Guzman were going to the country and we were right. pushing for a progressive program, uh, and telling people that what we need is you know, we need effective land reform, we need you know, to be able to have industrial policy. We right. had this really big um, uh, and detailed program that combined both a nationalistic uh, 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 and, 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 and a progressive pro-socialist way. People were very open to that, especially young people. And right. especially people young, would come definitely. to us and say, hey, right. we'd vote for you, but you know, the most important thing is keeping Marcos from coming to power. Therefore, we'll vote for Rennie yeah, and yeah. we'll vote for, uh, I don't, who was that fellow now? Pico? Uh, Pico, yes. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I saw what you did there, Walden. I saw what you did there. <laughs> but, but, Oy, but, but, ano sa sa cabinet ni ano, diba? Have you heard that? That, you know, their, their ideas about, you know, maybe Mauro has or Kiko Pine and joining a, Unity cabinet or something like that. I don't know. Anyways, maybe... well, I would not be surprised <laughs> because alam mo naman, these are the people who are what do they call Balimbing, no? So <laughs> pragmatic, pragmatic people, pragmatic. Oh, okay. Actually. Oh well, you yeah. know. But in any event, um, what I was trying to say is that right. um, now that that sort of um, let's let's vote for the um, lesser evil or kind of uh, idea. Now that that uh, that kind of politics you know, uh, has become discredited, I think that opens up the possibility for um, real, uh, much more progressive thinking. Right. And that's why the role of people like you and others to constantly push the envelope so that we open up, whether it's thinking about the way politics should run, the economy should run, uh, yeah. uh, is is very important at this point in time. So, I I I I have a sense that, um, uh, for instance, in the case of uh, Laila Dilima. Yes, that, let's talk about Laila because I know you have that, a lot of respect for. Her. Sorry, Walden, to cut you that. I mean. I'll be honest. I know this is going to put me in trouble. I think if there's a Filipino deserve the Nobel Peace Prize, it's Laila de Lima. I think there's no one who has come as close to sacrifice. And, you know what I'm saying? And I think in Russia, it should have been someone like Navalny. I'll just say it on the record. I'm not, I'm not shy to say that. I think she was the one who definitely deserves the Nobel Peace Prize. Um, tell me about your relationship with uh, Laila de Lima. I mean, uh, she, has, uh, she clearly is inspired by you, right? I've seen a lot of posts that she said about, you know, words of encouragement, your writings, your politics of conviction. Uh, you know, of course, she has a liberal party, mainstream politics, uh, you know, background. But I think both of us can agree that Leila de Lima is, is really cut from a different cloth, right? Well, as far as the the mainstream opposition leaders are concerned. Can you tell me about it? Do we need... Yes, no, definitely. De De yeah, definitely. Yeah. I, I think that she is an exemplar of the kind of exactly. politics that we need in the country. Unyielding... Yeah. She's, yeah. you know, very much committed to principle. Uh, she's, um, rather than get out of jail in an easy way, she wants to be, she wants to win uh, her cases because she's feel, she, she knows that, that, that's, yeah. that's, um, it's, if it's more important to be right than to be comfortable, right. um, you know, in, in being allowed out of, of jail. So I, I, I do think that her example has really motivated a lot of people mm -hmm. and uh, they see this um, and I, I think she is the person who has a really good um, opportunity to, you know, to, to, to advocate uh, a politics of principle mm -hmm. and a politics with an agenda that's very different from the sort 
of uh, um, patron yeah, uh, yeah, the uh, personalistic politics that's going on at this point. Right. I I have a very close alliance with Lila ever since I was in Congress. Um, she, you know, we, you know, she very much was supportive of the initiatives that I had, especially around jailing those um, uh, people in the um, in the um, Dole that were exploiting our. Um, yeah, this is when your role as the chairman of the OFW first. Yeah, yes, uh, yes, Congress. right. So uh, Lila and I worked closely then, and uh, ever since she's been in jail, uh, I have whenever I can um, help her in terms of writing about her case uh, internationally, I, I've right. done that. And so I, you know, I, uh, I, I think that that's one shining example exactly. that I, I think we, exactly. we can have. It's Lila, it's the youth opening up. Uh, and, uh, and my sense is that um, progressive leaders, um, uh, and intellectual leaders like yourself, you know, uh, can play this very big role uh, in terms of opening up the the, the vision or the, the opportunities for thinking about alternatives. So, I I would say that um, mm. uh, yes, it's important to realize that uh, our neighbors are you know are moving in, right. in in ways that we need to move, but I. I'm also confident that although it may not be very clear at this point, that um, that we are going to be part of that wave, uh, and hopefully some a number of different things can come together to push that. But the main thing I think is that we have restless youth, and yeah. um, the important thing is to realize that it was the restless youth in Thailand Correct. that created. Yeah. That exactly. created these possibilities. You know, they yeah. were the ones who went out in the streets, yeah. and they were the ones who inspired the future forward uh, and move forward party to emerge. Uh, you know? So this is a youth party, and a, yeah. basically, this last elections really, you might call it a product of a youth revolution. And my yeah. sense is exactly. that we will have that also in the Philippines because. You know, I you, but the we, have, we have that restless youth who yeah. are not satisfied with the very limited kind of future that is being offered either by the current administration right. uh, and the institutions uh, uh, or by the 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 liberal party opposition. You know, uh, which uh, uh, you know, I I mean, this kind of politics is something that we probably will be leaving behind. But we need that yeast of, of the youth that really would be very important. Last point, are you looking forward to um, working with, um, with Senator De Lima once she's out, oh, God willing, sooner than later? I mean, I, th I think she, will really, she could really inject a lot of energy, right? As, uh, you, know, you, uh, you know, I remember I... I oh, yes, yes. Uh, but, you know, I, 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 I plan to, of course, uh, work with her, not necessarily in any sort of a formal uh, way, but any way that I can help her out um, um, would be would be something that uh, I, 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 I would I would definitely offer my my services to to, yeah. to helping her out. Thank you very much. On that note, thank you very much, uh, Walden Bellio, Professor Walden Bellio for for joining us. There's so much more to discuss that I just felt we have to have a separate episode on that. Your your energy and your dedication has always been a source of inspiration. Um, uh, you're you're still strong and going, and I mean, I mean uh, you know, not long ago I had a conversation with Henry Kissinger at at hundred, right? Uh, and and you know, he he comes from a very different background and all, but for me, it's people who you know are from a different generation of mine, but seem to still live the young man's life and schedule that give me the energy and shame me into not complaining about my schedule. So thank you very much, uh, Walden, uh, for, for, for joining us and for your fantastic uh, inputs and for for keeping the faith. You know? and, and I know that you're not keeping the faith just because you're keeping the You are a sociologist. You understand the forces out there, the good forces that can come together and work for the Philippines. And the reason why we're having this discussion is because I'm saying 
we don't need to look to uh, need to look to United States or Norway or New Zealand. Just in our own neighborhood, a lot of exciting things are happening, uh, and it's not happening because they have the good dictator. It's happening because they have activism. They have students. They have young people who are pushing for radical change. Whether it's in Malaysia, whether it's in Thailand, whether it's in Indonesia, and hopefully soon again in the Philippines. Once upon a time, we were the leaders for democratic transformation in the region. We held the torch. Now perhaps it's time for us to learn a thing or two from our neighbors. And I thought no one is better than you, Alden, because you are, you know, the, you're the extraordinary scholar, a public intellectual, and you, you know a lot of these regional leaders very well, and you have been embedded in the regional political economy and activism for quite some time. So thank you so much for sharing your time. And I'm I'm looking at comments here. Marami na tawa, Walden. I know you're exhausted and you're wondering sinong binablabber mo dyan, but I'm getting comments right and left here and people are so happy to hear you and they feel super inspired. Thank you so much, Walden. Talk to you soon. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Richard, for, for inviting me. And I think your program plays a very big role in terms of inspiring people and getting them to think and to question um, uh, where, where, you know, th uh, things. And, um, you know, with people like you, uh, uh, you know, we you know, we'll, we'll get this country together again, uh, to, moving in, 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 in the right uh, direction. But of course, as you know, very well know, uh, a number of us are getting there. We're, you know, hitting our 70s or 80s, you know. So it's really young people, young people like you, who are really uh, on the forefront of the next generation of change in the Philippines. Thank you so much, Walden. Keep keep the young man spirit there and <laughs> hopefully I can disturb you soon again. Maram salamat, Walden, and talk okay. to you. Okay, bye-bye.